move to a time of prayer, and I was thinking about this earlier in the song, one of the songs we sang. It talked about kneeling with our hands lifted high. And I got to thinking about posture for prayer. What kind of posture should we take for prayer? Some of us have been standing. Some of us have been sitting. Some of us might want to even pray. And the Lord reminded me of being an altar that's always a wonderful place to pray. And I'm not asking you to necessarily be there unless the Lord's directing you to do so, but I want to pray for you at this point. And I want to ask God's presence to join us as it's already been revealed here. And Matt, that was such a powerful song you sang for us. Thank you for that testimony. The Lord keeps chasing after us, doesn't he? Thanks be to God. So, if you would like to stand while we pray, that's good. If you want to stay seated while we pray, that's good. If you want to kneel right where you are, that's good. If you want to come up and join me here at the altar and pray, that's good. But whatever posture you're going to take, let's assume it now, and let's talk to the Father this morning. Father God, we're, uh, we're reminded in Psalm says, praise the Lord, O my soul, and all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Lord, we acknowledge you as the great God this morning. And as we've gathered here to sing praises to your name and to testify to your goodness at the beginning of 2024, we just want to be reminded one more time of what you've already done for us through Jesus on the cross. Thank you, Father, for all that you've done for me. Thank you for what you've done for my family. And thank you, Lord, for what you've done for our church family. Thank you for what you've done through every church and every Christian who has been faithful to the word in this past season. And I pray, Lord, that you would continue to pour out your incredible benefits, your many, many blessings. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving our sin and setting us on a pathway of righteousness and holiness. Thank you that in your vision of the future for each of us, you see in each of us a Christ-like character that we can barely imagine, but you have decided to shape it and form it in us as we submit to the leadership of your spirit. And today, Lord, we acknowledge you as the Lord and leader of all. You are the leader, and we cry out to you. Matter of fact, Psalm David, Psalmist David cried out in Psalm 102, just one psalm before, 103, he said, hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry for help come to you. Do not hide your face from me when I am in distress. Turn your ear to me, and when I call, answer me quickly. For my days vanish like smoke, and my bones burn like glowing embers. And sometimes we feel like David, that challenges and difficulties come our way. I was talking earlier with some who I know are facing physical needs and physical circumstances that are not easy. And as I look around the room, I realize some are probably not here due to illness. And so, Father, we lift them up. We ask for your healing touch upon them and that you would provide for the circumstances that are difficult and challenging. Thank you for those you've touched and those you've healed. Thank you how you've protected us from this renewed season of COVID. And I pray that, Lord, you would continue to guide and direct in that area. We thank you, Lord, that in our distress, we can cry out to you, and you hear us when we pray, and you've never forgotten us. You always know our zip code. Zip code. You know our cell phone number. You can reach us, and, and you do, and thank you, Father, for that. We love you today. We acknowledge your greatness, and we come to you with our petitions. So, Lord, we think now about the future, and we think about maybe later this day, how we'll have opportunity to be witness for you, or throughout this next week, how we might intentionally reach out to someone who has the need and love for the love of Christ. Or perhaps you will give us a greater 
an area of ministry that we've never considered before or a new challenge or a new opportunity. And so, Lord, as we think about the future, we know one thing, like a pastor friend of mine used to pray, we want to put our little hand in your big hand, <laughs> Lord. Please help us to make sure that we're guided by you, guided by your will, directed by your way. Thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing. And we place ourselves completely and powerfully in your hand, for you are God, and we praise you in the name of your name. Lord, in the remainder of this service, I believe your spirit's going to speak to me, to all of us, if we'll just be open. So, Lord, I pray that you would use the words of the preacher today to speak into our hearts, to challenge us to live the Christ-like life, to surrender if we need to, to confess where we need to, and to be ready to step forward by faith in the joys that you have for us. And for all these things we pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. 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 If the pastor will give me a, an opportunity to give a brief greeting, can I do that still? It's good to see each of you here at Cross Point Church. Cheryl and I had a wonderful opportunity to come uh, to be with you today because something else got canceled, so our schedule was open and free, and here we had an opportunity to come and be with you. And when our schedule got changed, it meant we got to get, have our granddaughter with us, and then she said, can I go to Verity's Church? Can I go to Verity's Church? So that's been all she's talked about since she's been with us, so... Uh, Praise the Lord for Verity's testimony, right? Huh? And, and all the Coopers, too. So we thank the Lord for that. Um, we, we, uh, we are seeing something really remarkable these days on the Virginia District, and I just want to give testimony to God for it. Um, we've seen some really remarkable things. And I, I wish I had this slide that I could show you, but I, I wasn't that, I didn't plan it well enough to be able to tell you. But if you'll listen carefully, I'll describe it carefully, all right? Listen to this. This is numbers reported from our pastors and churches here on the Virginia District. First of all, we asked our churches to make intentional efforts to go into the community. We call it Project Go. And every month we ask churches to report to us ways they've gone into the community to make a difference. We didn't know exactly what that number would be, but we hoped that by the end of a year's time, there would be a report of 1,500 project go efforts that's a lot of project go efforts into the community and where our church year starts the first of april and so from april till now i've gotten a report from about 70 percent of the churches we're still working on 100 percent reporting uh, so we're, we're getting there but would you like to know how how many of the 1500 we've already had reported would you like to know well the rest of you you're going to hear it too i guess all right <laughs> 1,460, how about that? With That's about great. two months or so left to go in the year, two and a half months, we we're almost mm. ready to go over our goal, praise God. That means our churches are not just staying in-house, but they're intentionally going into the community. Thanks be to God for that. We asked churches to report to us how many new leaders they've added. And we set a goal, hoping that every church would add at least two, and that would mean the goal would be about 200. We've surpassed this goal like crazy. <clears throat> Pastors have reported already that we've added 512 leaders in the, dis in the churches on the district. How about this? We had a goal of hoping that in our churches we would have during the year 7,500 guests. Actually, the original goal was 5,000, but we revised it because we knew we were going to pass it. And as of today, we've had 8,105 guests in our churches. We praise God for that. How about an important number, like how many people have been converted to the faith? We set a goal of 750. As of today, pastors are reporting that 789 people have come to faith in Christ through the ministries of the Church of the Nazarene. How about new Nazarenes? These are new members to the church. The goal is 500, and we're at 356. That's good progress. And then how about baptisms? The goal was 500, and we're at 356. We praise God for that. That's really good. It's amazing, and we have a couple of months left, and we believe we'll achieve most, if not all, of these goals. And whatever happens, it's making a difference in their lives for sure. Amen. Um, 
this past year we had uh, an ordination service like we normally do, and uh, I was uh, I was privileged to be there and to help have some leadership role in it. Although General Superintendent Gustavo Crocker was the person in charge of the service, and uh, pastors, you guys have been to ordination service. Some of you have been to ordination services. You may know that ordination services are fairly rigid in their planning. In other words, we don't normally add much in them once we get them set and ready to go. I wouldn't call them stiff and cold, but I might call them stiff and cold sometimes. But we had been praying this past year for 21 days that God would give us freedom in the spirit as we got together for district assembly. And I was sitting up on the platform while Dr. Gustavo was preaching, and he preached an incredible message. And all the while he's preaching, I'm thinking, there are people that need to go pray at the altar. I hope he gives an altar call. And he got to the end of his message, and then he did this, which I've never heard a general superintendent do before. He said, and now I'm going to invite the district superintendent to come and close in prayer as he sees fit. Which I thought, well, that's my clue. The Spirit is leading. And in the middle of an ordination service, when we never do this, I walked up to the front and I said, I think there's some people who need to pray. And if you'd like to, the altar's open. Within 30 seconds, both areas of the altar is much longer than areas were lined with people praying. And I have a picture. This is why I wish I'd gotten these pictures to you. There's a picture of, uh, well, of one of the ordinands standing there watching as her husband is praying with somebody. And you can't see who he's praying with, but I did a little investigative research and found out that the ordinand's husband was praying with his brother, his twin brother, who was praying about whether or not God had called him to be a pastor. And this past week, I had lunch with him, and we talked about where he might go and be a pastor in the next few weeks. How about that? Isn't God good? God is so faithful, and I'm glad that we've been a praying people. So this coming year, we have district assembly again. All the churches will gather. Representatives from here will be there. You'll be there. You're invited. Everybody can come. But one of the things that's so very important is that we must be people of prayer. And in the next few days... We are going to be inviting you, and I'll get the information to your pastors that they can share with you, into a 21 days of prayer leading right up to our the event we call the Great Gathering. And I want to ask some of you to join us in praying in that area. That's 21 days. You'll have lots of ways to get involved. There will be a printed uh, booklet, a 21-day prayer guide that you can follow. There will be an email that you can sign up for so that if you prefer to get it by email, you can get it by email. I think they're even going to make it available by text if we can figure out how to do that, too. Or you can just join in a morning Zoom call with Nazarenes from all around the district. Or if you prefer evening, an evening Zoom call. Or if you want to do both, you can do both. And you can be part of a prayer time during those 21 days. And then the last seven days leading up to the great gathering, we're asking the Nazarenes from around the district to join us in praying for 168 hours without stop for the great gathering in the district assembly. 168 hours. Is anybody doing math real quick? How many days is that? A lot. Seven. You got it. 168 hours is one full week. And for one full week, we're hoping to have 24-7 coverage praying for district assembly along five themes. And so that means we're going to need some people to pray at 2 and 3 and 4 in the morning. Hello? And so we're going to have little half-hour time slots. Um, some of you are up at 2 and 3 in the morning anyway. You ought to sign up for that. I mean, you might, you might go to sleep earlier, but you get up then for a little while. So you might as well go ahead and pray, right? And so you could do that. And so we want to ask some of you to sign up. You'll have opportunity to sign up and to get one of those spots. I believe God's going to help us to be a people of prayer. And who knows? Who knows what else might happen during the great gathering, right? It might be like Brian, whose brother Scott prayed with him, and now he's a pastor or about to be a pastor. You just never know how God is going to work. And just let me say, we love you. We're so grateful to be here with you today. It gave us great joy when our granddaughter this morning said, I get to go to church. I'm so excited. That blesses a grandpa's heart, don't you think? And uh, she was so excited about coming and being here. Not just any church, this church with you. So God is faithful. 
and we're excited about what God has in the rest of this story. Next time I'll be better prepared and have slides too. God bless you. Hey, that was some good news, amen? We'll always take some good news. God is moving. He is still working. He is still doing things. He's still up to something good all the time. And that's a great testimony. And uh, it's really interesting that the district's looking at doing a 21 days of, of prayer. And uh, in fact, uh, we've been talking about that here at Cross Point, um, 21 days of prayer and fasting that we have coming up in just a few weeks that we're going to be starting that. So uh, that just tells me that God is in this. God is moving in this. And if the district's doing something that we're talking about as well, we're in sync. We're doing this together. So, um, you know, I want to say good morning again. And it's a good day to be here at Cross Point in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. And I just want to welcome you all again this morning. Um, and I want to say welcome home. Whether you've been here uh, for many, many years or whether you're fairly new, uh, you belong here at Cross Point. This is a, a church home for you, a family of believers that love you and love each other. And, um, you know, the thing about Cross Point is we come together, and our vision here is we, we're about pursuing God, and we're about growing in our faith, discovering the purpose that he has for our lives, and transforming other lives in the process. Amen? I know it's been such a great week this last week. Um, it started off with an inspirational message, let me tell you, inspirational message. If you were not here, maybe you were sick, maybe you had other things going on, uh, Pastor Lindley brought an amazing message from the Lord, and if you didn't get to watch it yet, I would encourage you to go back and watch the message. You will absolutely be blessed, you don't want to miss that. But today we are starting a brand new sermon series, and you can see it's already up. It's called Battle Ready, and it's exactly about what Dr. Fuller was just mentioning. Um, today, we're talking about awakening the warrior within. Awakening the warrior within. And so, this morning, I'm going to be sharing with you what it means to be battle ready in life. We're going to be talking about spiritual warfare, prayer, and fasting, and what it means to awaken the warrior within each of us. So, I want to ask you a question this morning. I think it's an easy one. I think I know the answer. But you got to be really, really honest with me. You promise? Really honest with me. I want to ask you, if you knew for certain, I mean you knew for absolutely sure, without the faintest doubt, that God would answer your prayers, who would pray more? Who would pray more? Right? Let's see those hands. We would, right? I would too. I'm talking about if you have a direct line to your heavenly daddy, right? You pray, he answers. It's almost like a text message, response, instant, or voicemail. Who would pray more about everything? Right? Right? That's what we're talking about this morning. Well, let me tell you about somebody who lived life exactly that way, and he lived not so long ago. All right? We're not talking about someone from biblical times. His name is George Mueller. And he was born in Prussia in 1805, what is now modern-day Germany. He started his life off all wrong. He was a liar, a thief, and a gambler. Let me tell you about his early life. His father was a tax collector, and by 10 years old, he was stealing government money from his dad. At 14, his mother was literally dying. She was literally in her deathbed, passing away, and he was in the other room playing cards and drinking with friends. What came next was like a movie script of a guy who just couldn't get it right. Around age 16, he was living it up, going from one hotel to another, always with a lady by his side, the ultimate playboy. But here's the twist. He was flat broke. Flat broke. He was so desperate that he pawned off anything valuable, and he left a trail of debt behind him. Well, the law eventually caught up with him, and boom. George Mueller landed in prison. Even there, he couldn't stop spinning tales. He's trying to impress everybody around him. His dad had to bail him out, pay off his debts, and yeah, George got a good old-fashioned whooping. Now you think that straightened him out, right? Come on, you think that straightened him out? Prison, 
a whooping from his dad, dodge a bullet because his dad paid off his debts. Nope. George slipped right back into his old ways. Now he's racking up even more debt. He even cooked up a crazy story about getting robbed and played on his friend's sympathies to get cash to pay it off. When they found out, here's George's response. Eh, no big deal. He couldn't have cared less. Now, eventually, George, he lands in university, and he's studying theology. That's the study of God, of all things. And George and his buddies, they go full on Ocean's Eleven. They forge papers to fund a wild vacation in Switzerland. Now, George, he's a smooth operator, so he managed to find a way to pay even less than everybody else. He's still playing his tricks. But then out of the blue, an old buddy named Beta invites him to a prayer meeting. George is probably thinking, uh, why not? I got nothing better to do. So he goes along, and guess what? That meeting flipped his world upside down. It was like a light switched on. From that point on, George Mueller started on a path that would make him a legend in the faith community. It's a story of transformation that shows no matter how far off you are from God, there's always a way back. It's all about that moment of truth, that turning point. And for George, it was right there in that prayer meeting. George said about this day, he said, I have no doubt that God began a work of grace in me. Even though I scarcely had any knowledge of who God truly was, that evening was the turning point of my life. He began regularly reading the Bible, discussing Christianity with others at the Bible study. And after seeing a man on his knees, on his knees, isn't that interesting? Praying to God. He was convicted of his need for salvation. He went to his bed. He knelt and prayed and asked God to help him in his life and to bless him wherever he went and to forgive him of his sins. And here's what happened next. He immediately stopped drinking, stealing, and lying. And he began to hope of becoming a missionary. A missionary. Rather than being a comfortable clergyman that his father had envisioned for him, he began preaching regularly in nearby churches. You see, when he encountered God, everything changed. Mueller isn't just a name in the history books. He became a force of faith in action. He began to pray about everything. Literally everything. After this total life transformation, George, George Mueller starts to do some seriously epic stuff. He's got his hands in not just one, but four major ministries that are changing lives left and right. But here's what really sets him apart, was his work with orphans and how he began to pray about everything. He was a prayer warrior. So I want you to imagine this with me. Imagine this scenario. We're in England, and it's not a happy time for kids without parents. They're either stuck in grim workhouses or they're trying to survive on the streets. Kind of like the kids you'd read about in a Charles Dickens novel. But George, he sees this and he says, not on my watch. He starts this incredible orphanage in Bristol, England. And it's like a beacon of hope. He's not giving these kids just a roof over their heads. He's feeding them. He's clothing them. And he's making sure they get an education. And he's making sure they know about God. Now we're talking about a guy who cared for up to 2,000 orphans at one time. And over 10,000 throughout his life. That's mind-blowing. And here's the truly shocking part. Mueller did this, all of this, by leaning into an outrageous faith. George never put up fundraising posters. He never blasted his needs all over social media. He just took it all to God in prayer. The only time people found out what was needed and how it all came together was when they read his annual reports. That's when they saw the big picture of how God had showed up and provided. 
Now here's the real jaw job. George recorded over 50,000 specific answers to his prayers in his journals. 50,000. Now who here this morning has had 50,000 prayers answered that you've documented? Not me. I can't put my hand up. Why not? Here's what the Apostle James says in chapter 4, verse 2 of his epistle. You have not because you ask not. And when what you ask aligns with God's goodness and his divine purposes, when we align our will and our desires to his will and his desires, there is nothing, church, there is nothing that we can ask in Jesus' name to the glory of God that he will not answer. Out of these 50,000 answered prayers, 30,000, 30,000 were like instant responses. They were answered the same day and oftentimes the same hour that he prayed. That's like God giving the green light to more than one prayer a day, every day, for an entire 60 years. You see, through his faith, God channeled what would be over half a billion dollars today right through George's hands, just because he asked in prayer and was aligned with God's purposes. It's like George had a direct line to heaven, showing us all what's possible when you truly believe. George Mueller's life is a powerful example of what happens when you put your faith into action and live a life surrendered to God. It's about believing God for the impossible and then watching him work in ways that blow your mind. And his story, it's not just a story that I'm telling you for inspiration. It's a blueprint for us on how to live in audacious faith, trusting God for the big, the small, and everything in between. I want you to know today that the very same potential that George Mueller tapped into exists within every believer who follows after Jesus. I said that same potential exists within every believer who follows after Jesus. No matter where you are in your faith journey, God is ready to unleash that potential, especially in moments where we desperately need to hear from him. So has there ever been a moment in your life where you desperately needed to hear from God? Anybody? A moment where you said, I got to hear from you. I need an answer to this prayer. Amen? Maybe it was an emergency situation where you were out of options and you just need God to move. Maybe it's a situation where you had to make a life-changing decision that would affect more people than yourself. And you needed to know for certain, what does God want you to do? This need to hear from God, to have him step into our situations, it's not new. It's the very same type of situation that we find in the story of King Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 3 through 4. And his story mirrors our own experiences of facing seemingly insurmountable challenges and needing to rely entirely on God's guidance and strength. Let's take a closer look at how Jehoshaphat's response in a time of great need reveals the powerful potential for spiritual warfare that's available to every follower of Jesus. But before we dive right into this passage, let's set the scene a little bit. Let's look at the biblical context in the story. I want you to imagine with me for a moment that you're King Jehoshaphat of Judah. You're sitting comfortably in your palace, maybe reviewing some plans or thinking about your kingdom's future. But then suddenly, your world is turned upside down when messengers burst into your throne room. With terrifying news. A vast army is coming against you. And this isn't just any army that we're talking about. It's a coalition of powerful enemies. It's the Moabites, the Ammonites, and others. It's the kind of news that makes your heart stop for just a moment. So what do you do? Well, for Jehoshaphat, this was more than just a military crisis. He saw the root cause. 
this was a spiritual emergency. This is where our story in 2 Chronicles 23 through 4 kicks off. Read this with me. Jehoshaphat was afraid and turned his attention to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord. They even came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. Here the Bible says that Jehoshaphat was afraid. Let's pause just there for a moment. He was afraid. This wasn't a king that's just detached from the emotions that his people felt as well. He was human, just like any of us, feeling the weight of the moment, but also the importance of his very next decision. So here's where things take a turn. Jehoshaphat doesn't let fear have the last word. The scripture says in one translation, he resolved to inquire of the Lord. And in another he said that he set his face to seek the Lord. He proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judah. This wasn't just a personal moment, it was a national call to action. Jehoshaphat brought his people together, not for war planning, but for prayer and fasting. Picture this. The people of Judah from every town gathering in Jerusalem. There's a palpable sense of urgency, but also there's unity. They're unified in this moment. They're not just preparing for battle with swords and shields. They're arming themselves with prayer and fasting. They're seeking God's guidance, his protection, his intervention. And this scene at the temple in Jerusalem is powerful. Jehoshaphat stands before the people. He leads them in prayer and openly acknowledges the nation's powerlessness against the great horde coming against them. It's a raw moment of vulnerability and dependence on God. And Jehoshaphat's his prayer ends with these striking words in verse 12 of the same chapter. He says, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. But our eyes are on you. This is a statement of complete trust and reliance on God, even when the path ahead is clouded in uncertainty. And just like Jehoshaphat, we all face our vast armies. These aren't literal armies for us, but they're overwhelming challenges, fears, and struggles in our daily lives. It could be a personal crisis or a health issue, like we know a lot of, about those recently, right? A broken relationship. It could be financial stress. It could even be deep-seated fears about the future. These are our Moabites and Ammonites. They threaten our peace. They loom over us, making us feel powerless and sometimes afraid. But you see, just as Jehoshaphat chose to seek the Lord in that moment, awakening the spiritual warrior within, we must awaken our spiritual senses in order to awaken the spiritual warrior within each of us. If we want victory when we face our own trials. If we don't, do nothing. Now there are four steps to awakening our spiritual senses. The first step is the reality of spiritual warfare. The reality of spiritual warfare. I want you to imagine for a moment that you're wearing a blindfold. You can't see anything. It's completely dark. And you're in a room filled with obstacles. You're trying to navigate through, but you keep bumping into everything. You trip, you fall down. You try to get back up, but you lose your balance. This is life without an awareness of spiritual warfare. Many think spiritual warfare is just something from a fantasy novel. It's not reality. But the Bible paints a different picture. It is a real, ongoing battle, not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces. According to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, it's happening all around us, whether we acknowledge it or not. Let's address some common misconceptions about spiritual warfare. Here's the first myth. Oh, spiritual warfare is only for the spiritually elite. You know, those super spiritual folks. 
not for me. The reality is that every believer is in this battle. You're already in it. It's not reserved for pastors or super spiritual people. It is a daily reality for every Christian. The second myth is that spiritual warfare is always dramatic and visible. You just see it everywhere. But often it's subtle in the lies that we believe. And there's a lot of that going on. The fears that paralyze us. The conflicts that arise in relationships. It's in the daily decisions where we either give ground to God or the enemy in our life. Understanding this reality is the first step in awakening our spiritual senses. It's time to take off the blindfold and see the battle for what it is. The second step is the power of prayer. Listen, prayer is not just some religious ritual. This is our primary weapon in this unseen battle. The battle we're already all in. Think of this as a walkie-talkie in the war zone of life. It's how we communicate with our commander, seeking his guidance and strength. It's about connecting with God. Prayer is where we pour out our hearts to God, where we receive his peace and his presence in return. It's about asserting authority. You see, in Christ, we have authority over the enemy's schemes. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. When we pray, we're not just whispering wishes into the wind. We're exercising our God-given authority to push back the darkness. Prayer is where fear loses its grip and faith takes its stand. It's where we align with God's will and his power is unleashed in our lives. The third step is the role of fasting. Oh, that's a dirty word for some people. <laughs> fasting is often misunderstood and underutilized. Listen, it's not a spiritual hunger strike or a method to twist God's arm. Fasting is voluntarily giving up something, often food, to tune into God's frequency more clearly. It's about humility and submission. Fasting is a way of saying, God, you are more important than my physical desires. It's a posture of humility and submission before the God of creation, the one that who, who made us, who loves us. Fasting is about sharpening the spiritual senses. When we fast, our spiritual senses are heightened. We become more attuned to God's voice, more aware of his presence, and more sensitive to his leading. Fasting isn't about getting from God, but getting to God. I'm going to say that again. Fasting isn't about getting from God. It is about getting to God. It's about clearing the clutter in our lives to make room for more of him. We all need that. Step four, the synergy of prayer and fasting. You see, when prayer and fasting are combined, they create a spiritual synergy, a power that exceeds their individual effects alone. It's like combining two potent ingredients into a powerful medicine. We have some biblical examples of fasting. Just look at Jesus in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4. Before beginning his public ministry, he fasted and he prayed, preparing himself for what was to come. And his victory in the wilderness set the stage for his powerful ministry. We have modern examples of prayer and fasting. We already talked about George Mueller. You know him. He fasted on a regular basis as he sought answers from the Lord. And we already know what happened when he prayed and fasted. 50,000 answered prayers. What would you do with 50,000 answered prayers? 50,000. John Wesley, one of the primary leaders through which we trace our spiritual heritage, was a strong advocate for regular prayer and fasting. He integrated these disciplines deeply into his personal life and encouraged them among his followers. Wesley fasted and prayed regularly on Wednesdays and Fridays. And he believed that prayer and fasting were essential means of grace. 
What that means is they are tools for spiritual growth and development. First, he said that they increased his spiritual strength and focus. He said that prayer and fasting helped to sharpen his focus on God in spiritual matters. And these practices helped to reduce the distractions of the world and the flesh, and they allowed him to concentrate more fully on his relationship with God. Second, regular prayer and fasting enhanced his ability to discern God's will. We all need to know what God is saying to us. Amen? He was more attuned to the Holy Spirit and better able to understand and interpret God's direction for his life and ministry when he was praying and fasting. Wesley also said that prayer and fasting contributed to the effectiveness of his ministry. He observed more powerful preaching, a deeper impact on his listeners, and greater success in his evangelistic efforts. Wesley also said uh, that it was part of his strong emphasis on personal holiness. He, he viewed prayer and fasting as key disciplines in the process of our journey in becoming more like Christ. And we call that sanctification. Wesley also believed in the power of prayer and fasting for intercession, for prayer, for standing in the gap for our friends and our family and our church family. He said that these practices had a significant impact when praying for others whether for their salvation, for their healing, or for their deliverance. Even though Wesley's primary focus was on the spiritual benefits, he also acknowledged that fasting could even have positive effects on our physical health and emotional well-being. Now, Wesley's teachings on prayer and fasting were not simply theoretical, just some ideas he had. They were born out of his own deep personal experiences and practice. Wesley's approach to prayer and fasting was integral to the revivals of his day and the First Great Awakening with its emphasis on personal piety and devotion to God. But let me tell you, why does any of this matter? Let me tell you why it matters. You see, prayer connects us to God, and fasting disconnects us from the world. I'm going to tell you, some people... We need to be disconnected from the world. We need to be more connected to God and his will for our lives. Together, these position us to experience God's power and breakthroughs in ways that we could never experience on our own. It's not about earning God's favor. It's about preparing our hearts to receive what he already wants to give us. I want you to think about prayer and fasting in this way. Imagine them as two wings of a bird. A bird really struggles with flying with one wing, don't you think? But each, although they're powerful on their own, just like a wing of a bird, together they enable us to soar to new spiritual heights. And when we combine these disciplines, we create an environment where miracles can happen. Who wants to see a miracle? Who wants to see a miracle in our lives? It creates an environment where chains are broken and where our faith is elevated to new levels. When we fast and pray, we're not just going through a spiritual exercise. We're entering a deeper level of trust in God. We're saying, God, I trust you so much that I'm willing to forego my physical comfort to seek you more earnestly. It's in these moments of deepened faith and a heightened spiritual focus that breakthroughs often occur. We hear report after report of breakthroughs when when folks are praying and fasting. And it's also when heightened spiritual focus brings to us a, a breakthrough in spiritual struggles, helps us find direction in our lives and even in physical and emotional healing. When we deny our physical selves through fasting, We are not just weakening our bodies. I know we think about that. Gosh, how am I going to get through the day if I'm fasting? We're not weakening our bodies alone, but we are strengthening our spirits. It's like training for an athlete. I mean, once they run a race over and over and over, it's harder at first as you're training, but then it gets easier and easier. 
And the more that we practice these disciplines, the stronger we become, not physically, but spiritually, in our spiritual lives. And I want you to remember that Jehoshaphat and the kingdom of Judah, they didn't just pray and fast as a last resort, but they did it as their first response to a crisis. And he saw it for what it was. He saw the spiritual world involved in this. He knew that this was not just a physical attack. This is something in this spiritual realm where he needed to seek God. And that was the first response. And so in our lives, when we're facing challenging armies, whether they be challenges, decisions, or spiritual battles, our first response should be to turn to prayer and fasting. And so I want to challenge you this week to consider what your vast armies might be in your own life and write it down. Or you could write down at least one area in your life where you really just need a breakthrough, where you really need God to intervene, where you really need an answer. And I want you to begin preparing yourself to face them, these challenges and these vast armies. I want you to prepare yourself to face them through prayer and fasting in the upcoming weeks. And see, God is with you, and he will guide you to the victory. But we have only but to ask. And so later in this series, we're going to have the opportunity to pray and fast together because we are not alone in this journey. Amen? As we do this, I want you, listen, I want you to expect an answer. As you pray and fast, expect an answer. Expect God's guidance. Expect his strength in that area where you need a breakthrough. And just as the people of Judah came together, we can support each other in prayer and fasting. And so I want to challenge you also to share your experiences and to pray for one another. I mean, our church is a praying church. I love that about Crosspoint. Continue in that. Pray for each other. And share the experiences when God answers those prayers. Don't keep it to yourself. That's a testimony that we all need to hear. You see, we need to be a community of spiritual warriors if we ever want to see Crosspoint make the greatest impact that we can for the kingdom of God. We have to be awakening our spiritual senses through prayer and fasting. And that's not about following a religious formula. It's about entering a deeper relationship with God. It's about recognizing the spiritual warfare around us and choosing to stand firm, armed with the powerful weapons of prayer and fasting. And as we embark on this journey, let's expect to see God move in our lives in extraordinary ways. I want to share one more gem with you this morning. I really want you to hear this. Pay close attention to this. You see, there's a secret about George Mueller. I mean, it's a powerful story, but there's a secret about it. You see, even though he was known for his profound faith, he initially struggled with prayer. Can you believe that? He struggled with prayer. Same man, 50,000 answered prayers, 30,000 almost instantly, but he struggled with prayer. See, for the first 10 years of his journey in trusting God and witnessing amazing answers to prayer, he found it challenging to really engage in prayer. His mornings were dedicated to prayer, but often he spent long stretches, sometimes up to an hour, just trying to connect, to really feel the presence of God. He realized that something had to change, so he made this completely pivotal shift in his approach. Instead of diving straight into prayer first thing in the morning, he began nourishing his heart with the truths of Scripture. And he experienced a dramatic effect from this decision. You already know what the effect was. You see, engaging with the Word of God first, especially the promises that God makes to us, he found himself entering into a more authentic and meaningful conversation with God about the things that he had said in his Word. There was no longer a struggle to focus with the Lord in prayer. It was about now a genuine conversation with his father and friend. And so as he began engaging with scripture 
and then letting it guide his conversations with God, it totally transformed his prayer life. Our own prayer life can be transformed in the same way. See, sometimes the key to a deeper connection with God isn't more effort, maybe more prayers, but it's a change in how we approach him. And the truth is, no matter where we are in our spiritual journey, whether it's been a few years we're following him or most of our lives, there's always room for growth and a deeper, more meaningful relationship with God. So when I ask you this morning, what is God speaking to your heart today? Do you feel that stirring deep within? That God is wanting to do something new, something fresh in you? Don't ignore it. Maybe you're here, you've been wrestling with doubts. You're wondering if God is truly listening to your prayers. If he really hears you when you call out to him. But let me assure you, he is listening. And he does hear you. And he does answer prayer. Maybe some of you are facing your own vast armies. Challenges that seem insurmountable. Fears that keep you awake at night. Struggles that you just can't seem to overcome. Remember Jehoshaphat's story when faced with an overwhelming force, his first response was to seek the Lord, to proclaim a fast, and to pray. And this wasn't just a personal act. It was a collective move of faith for the whole community. In our battles, whether personal, relational, financial, spiritual, our first call is to turn our faces to God in prayer and fasting. Let's bow our heads and turn our hearts to God in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we come before you today acknowledging that sometimes we feel overwhelmed by the challenges we face. But Lord, we take comfort in knowing that you are with us, that you hear our prayers, and that you respond to our cries. In this moment, God, we ask for your courage and the faith to face our vast army. Help us to awaken the spiritual warrior within each of us. Give us the strength to stand firm in faith. To rely on you alone as we seek after you through prayer and place our focus on you through fasting. We pray for those among us who are struggling to find that connection with you. Those who are wrestling with doubts or feeling distant. God, remind them of your ever-present love and your faithfulness. For anyone who feels overwhelmed today, whether it's by life circumstances, by decisions they need to make, or by challenges they are facing, Lord, be their guide and their comfort. Let them feel your presence and your peace. That surpasses all understanding. Now, God, we commit to taking action. We commit to not just being hearers of your word, but doers. So, Lord, help us in the coming weeks as we accept the challenge ourselves to set aside time for prayer and fasting, to seek your face, to listen to your voice. Whether it's a fast from food, from media, or from anything that distracts us from you, Lord, help us to focus our hearts and our minds on you. Father, we thank you for the examples of faith like George Mueller and John Wesley, who showed us what it means to live a life fully surrendered to you. May we follow in their footsteps, trusting you in all things, bringing our prayers and petitions before you with faith and expectancy. We pray all these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So as we go out this week, let's remember that we are not alone. We are part of a community of faith, a family that supports and strengthens one another. So let's be warriors in prayer, vigilant in fasting, and unwavering in our faith. God is with us. God is for us, and he is cheering us on. And so let's live our lives in such a way that when we finally stand before him, we hear those beautiful words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Go in peace. Be strong and courageous. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And let's awaken the warrior within and see what God will do through us this week.